Hello everyone and welcome to my recreation of the Voyager 2 mission in Kerbal Space Program on its 40th anniversary on August 20th, 2017. Here you can see me time warp to August 20th, 1977, actually August 19th because I wanted to give myself a day on the launch pad, but uh, we've got the timing right and here I am preparing the Voyager probe. Uh, we used the Voyager probe from Raider Nix US probes pack and we used a mix of FASA parts and other parts and also Raider Nix uh, US rocket parts to make the Titan rocket. So it's sort of a mix of mods on that. On my first attempt to launch it, I was using manual control while using Smart ASS. And while that worked fine for the beginning of the launch, it started to cause problems as we got past the speed of sound and where the huge fairing on this particular rocket created bad aerodynamic effects. Also, I had set the PID controller for MechJeb so that it wouldn't wobble so much further away from the Earth, but it turns out that that creates very slow reactions close to the Earth, and so instead I decided to let KOS handle it so that MechJeb wouldn't be involved. So KOS is much more precise about the corrections and can point at the prograde vector. I've worked on the script so it's much less likely to flip out now and indeed in this case it was basically the solution to our problems. Actually between the first launch and trying out KOS I had two other failed launches for various reasons but we'll skip over those for now they weren't very important reasons. In any case as you can see smooth as silk not even the hint of a wobble when using KOS here and it's very good at pointing at the prograde vector during the high dynamic pressure period. All right, here we go. Ignition of the core. And then the SRBs taper off. A little bit hard to decide exactly when to separate the SRBs given that they have sort of that smooth taper going for them. But if I recall correctly, it's supposed to be like 11 seconds after the core ignition. I think I held them for longer than that though. But still, very smooth, no problems. The core engines are an LR87 set. It's just called the LR87 even though it's two engines. They just come as a pair. And then there's the hot staging for the LR91. Even though KOS is in charge of the trajectory, I did the staging. That was just for my own simplicity. And three-part fairing comes off and we have our Centaur stage with the probe and the solid rocket booster on top. So, very interesting uh, figuring out the trajectory with this because of course the solid rocket booster has to be expended. You, uh, you have to make sure to use all of the, the Delta V provided by the Centaur and the payload assist module stage, the PAM stage. And right there, the Centaur stage completed orbit with some of its fuel and that was expected. Uh, it was very clear from the Delta V numbers in the VAB that that would be necessary. On plotting the Jupiter uh, transfer, uh, we got a little bit of a Ganymede encounter, but I don't think we were supposed to get one. And in any case, that periapsis is a little bit high. And the main thing is to aim for the Saturn encounter at the same time. And you can see me doing that here. And with that, we lose the Ganymede encounter, unfortunately. We also are arriving faster at Jupiter than NASA did in the real mission. And probably the reason for that is they timed it so that they had a good alignment of Jupiter's moons so that they could get shots of those. We didn't really work on that. Uh, we just focused on trying to hit uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. For those who don't know what's special about uh, the Voyager 2 mission, I should have said that right up front. It was a unique window of opportunity to get a satellite to pass by Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune on one round. And that was Voyager 2 only. Voyager 1 did not go for all four. So uh, this was a unique launch. Voyager 2 actually launched before Voyager 1. They were numbered that way because Voyager 1 would arrive at Jupiter first. Voyager 2 would be second. And actually Voyager 2 was consistently sort of behind Voyager 1 after the launch. So that's why they were numbered that way. Anyway, the Centaur stage did its thing as expected. And now the payload assist module, the sawed rocket motor, uh, lit and everything is good. I expected to use about 30 meters per second from the Voyager probe to make the final corrections and so as we see the the SRB tail out there uh, we've got 20 meters per second left on the, the maneuver node and we separate off that and now it's just the hydrazine inside the Voyager probe itself. I checked the vessel mass is the correct mass 
and the empty mass for Voyager is the correct mass, so it has the right amount of fuel. And I point that out because it has a lot of Delta V. You'll see it, it, it does a lot of corrections, and it turns out it has this fuel, which is good. Um, yeah, lots and lots of fuel available on the little Voyager probe. Very helpful. Okay, there we go, and so we have our Jupiter periapsis. Make sure, of course, when you're doing this mission, not to accidentally crash into Jupiter as you are making your plot for Saturn. Very important. And uh, once we pass by Jupiter, we'll be making sure that our approach to Saturn is corrected so that we also hit Uranus. And then once we uh, pass close to, uh, well, pass by Saturn, we will correct our approach to Uranus to make sure we hit Neptune. So that's how it works. If you can manage it ahead of time uh, to uh, like get all of them in a row, that'd be great. But that's really hard because of the sensitivity involved. Just a hundredth of a meter per second before the Jupiter encounter can have like a million kilometer effect at Saturn and then, you know, completely throw off your Uranus uh, encounter and stuff like that. Uh, also, you know, a fraction of a second difference in your burns can also have the same kind of effect. Uh, right, once you pass by Jupiter, that all goes away. The sensitivity is much less and in fact, uh, one meter per second burn before you hit Jupiter could cost a lot more after you pass by Jupiter because you no longer have Jupiter helping you out, uh, affecting your orbit. So it is like that. So we make a number of corrections. You can see another one here. It's interesting to note that the Jupiter flyby is the one that's furthest away from the planet. And then we get closer to Saturn than we did to Jupiter, and then closer to Uranus, and then the closest encounter is actually with Neptune. And the reason for that is very simple. Jupiter alone could like fling you out of the solar system if you get close enough to it. And you could see that with the New Horizons mission to Pluto, right? They only swung by Jupiter, and that was good enough to get them uh, fly by to Pluto. Uh, but in this case, we just want to go one planet at a time, so we need to stay a good distance away from Jupiter. And here is our encounter with Jupiter. It's, uh, NASA actually was around 500,000 kilometers. Uh, we got to 277,000 kilometers, much closer, but that was also because we were going faster and again, we didn't really aim for the Galilean moons properly. Uh, here you can see me adjusting now after we passed by Jupiter for our encounter with Uranus. So we're again using a gravitational assist at Saturn to make sure that we get close to Uranus. And you saw me fixing that up there. Uranus, you can always tell because the moons are going what you might perceive as vertically or 90 degrees off from the plane of the ecliptic. And that is because Uranus itself is tilted in its uh, unique way. Okay, so this is what our approach at Saturn looked like after a little bit of tweaking here. And you can see we're actually passing through the rings of Saturn rather close. The real mission got to around 100,000 kilometers. I'm using these round numbers to make it easier to remember. So 500,000 at Jupiter, 100,000 at uh, Saturn. It's I think it's uh, actually like 111,000 or something like that. But in any case, uh, we are getting a lot closer. You can see they're actually 16,000 kilometers, it says on the periapsis there. So yeah, very close. We're basically beating NASA on all these, but again, it's because our purposes are different. NASA wanted to get the nice pictures of uh, the moons and all. And so for them, the timing had to be a little bit different. And that's the thing when you recreate the Voyager missions is the window is actually quite large. And you have a lot of leeway to encounter these planets when you want to. And so you can make sure that you have like a Ganymede encounter if you want, or a Titan encounter. Voyager 1 was supposed to get the Titan encounter. That's what its goal was to fly by Titan. And that's why it was launched later. So you can manage that. Here we are uh, managing our Neptune encounter and uh, again with uh, assist from Uranus. You can see Uranus is actually curving our orbit a little bit to make sure that we go a little bit faster. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn and Uranus all gave boosts to Voyager 2, but the real Voyager 2 actually got slowed down by Neptune. It went along the wrong side of Neptune. And so here we are making the correction, still in Saturn SOI obviously and uh, getting some benefit from our velocity near Saturn in order to do this. It's not um, inclination burn, so it's not too bad. But uh, yeah, so Neptune actually slowed down Voyager 2 and that's why Voyager 1 is going much faster than it. In this case, we're going to avoid getting slowed down by it. We're trying to actually go as fast as possible. 
Uh, we're getting as big a boost as possible from each of the planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And we'll see how fast we go. Ultimately, we discovered ourselves much further out at the 40th anniversary of this probe than Voyager 2 is right now. Okay, so Uranus, not the most inspired atmospheric coloring I've seen on planets in real solar system, but okay, at least it's not completely off. I do have RSS expanded in this particular install, so we did have other moons around Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune that you might not have just a standard real solar system package. Though I couldn't really spot any of them around Uranus even though I was looking where they should be, which is off-plane from the regular plane of the solar system, where you might not expect them to be because of the axial tilt of Uranus. But yeah, couldn't find them. And here we have a correction burn. This is an inclination burn, but as you can see, just a few meters per second. Not a big deal. We were pretty good with our Delta V budget. As you can see, there's still about a quarter of the hydrazine left, and of course that's more than a quarter of the Delta V of the probe. So, pretty good. And we have uh, one more correction to go, and this is actually the correction to get us on the correct side of Neptune instead of the one that will slow us down. Right now, after Uranus, we are actually on the side of Neptune that would slow us down. Uh, so, it's actually the more accurate one right now without this correction, but we will instead opt for the boost and so I'm moving it to the correct side for that. Presumably that was not a big concern for NASA or that would have uh, timed it so that they wouldn't get the nice pictures that they wanted so that's probably why they didn't do this particular correction and of course you know you don't want to waste fuel if you don't absolutely have to and this was basically the last stop for the Voyager probe. Speeding up uh, by Neptune wouldn't be the greatest idea anyway because you you know you want to hang around as long as possible. It was inconvenient enough to be going as fast as the Voyager probe was going. But anyway, here we are, our final stop on this grand tour of the solar system. We successfully hit Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, even though I didn't have RCS on the Centaur stage. A little bit of flaw. That was, I think that was the only uh, flaw in the mission. Everything else went according to plan, more or less. And, yep, pretty smooth. It's relatively easy to recreate Voyager. You have to be really patient about the RCS burns and plotting, though. Very nice uh, sunrise uh, with uh, Neptune there. You can see the sun poking out. Uh, somebody pointed out that the sun really doesn't resize as you get further out. That's a bit of a flaw in KSP, unfortunately. But anyway, we continue to time warp through the 40 years and reach our current date, August 20th. Actually, by that time, UTC was August 21st at midnight, as it so happens. So I continue to time warp there. And we're much further out than either Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 because, again, we went closer to each of the planets and got more of a boost. But anyway, on that note, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.